Right, cue elevated music. A quick note before we start the show rolling for episode 48. Even though we make mention of the live recording in London at the House of Photography during the following programme, the places have now all been filled. So please don't email in for tickets. Apologies if you were particularly hoping to go. But of course, you'll still be able to hear the show when it goes out on week 52. Right, anno done. Alex, tell us who produces this thing, then we can start proper. The Fujicast is an independent Loading Zone production. We talked a lot over the Christmas period about uh, veganism. And it's almost like, like it's just, um, it is quite literally in your face everywhere now. And I'm, I'm mightily impressed, unless you're about to tell me otherwise, that you, you kept it going all through Christmas. I have. It's been nearly yeah. two months now. Wow. Yep. Look at me. That's I'm as been, fresh as a daisy. It's been two months. It, well, it was the end of November. Wow. So it's no. definitely been six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. All over Christmas. You feel better? Yeah. I'm sleeping yeah. better. I feel better. Are you, sl- are you actually sleeping better? Yeah. I, well, I feel like I am. Yeah, I've got no kind of scientific proof. I mean, of the, that. the weight. Uh, I mean, you look. You look like a new man. Hmm. That's just got new clothes on. <laughs> I always breathe in when I'm, I'm looking I'm at you. Re- no, I'm re- you don't need to look. When at I turn, me. when I turn around, I breathe out. I, I've, I've turned into. Um, I was saying to Kevin, I'm not, I'm not going to share this, but you can look it up. I've turned into um, uh, a, a frequency that used to uh, was, was my favourite radio station in London, LBC. I've turned into the the kilogrammic value of the LBC FM frequency, <laughs> and I'm I'm honestly thinking that the vegan thing is 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 may maybe there's something in this after all. Yeah, but you know what? It's not about the the not eating the stuff. It's about not snacking on crap. Ultimately, I didn't. You can crap uh, crap. You can crap on snacks. You <laughs> can thank you very much. <laughs> you can uh, give me that Kit Kat. <laughs> we'll, edit, we'll edit that out. We, <laughs> uh, if we remember, well, you can snack on um, on on rubbish, can't you? you can Just snack. as easily as a vegan. There's, as you can, there's you can, loads uh, of stuff. Yeah. I mean, most like crisps and things like that. Often, and if they're yeah, they so don't I have say, kind you, of milk and stuff in them, they, they so it's know, nothing. It's nothing to do with the veganism there. That's, that's no, but it's a mindset. Will, that's your yeah. willpower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As Gemma says, Gemma always says that you know she. I've got the best willpower she's ever seen in anybody like if i say i'm going to do something i'll do yeah. it well no your, your career is proof of that isn't it so veganism is will you go the full full hog by the way because uh, i was listening to a, a phone in yesterday uh, where, where they were talking about um going the full hog and not wearing leather shoes and no. things like that no no no, no, no. Not, no listen i'm not doing this to save the poor animals although it's nice that the poor animals are getting less cut up because right. of me yeah. however what i did do i did research it a little bit after i started and I read somewhere that if you if you didn't if one person didn't eat meat for mm. the whole year mm. or had any kind of um, dairy anything basically that that forces an animal to exist if you like you mm. know belch and all that kind of stuff mm. it's the equivalent of not driving a car for a year no way in terms of emissions saved you are joking yeah wow seriously that's what I read whether it's true or not I'm fairly sure it's true because it was in a kind of you know it was on the BBC or something in a documentary. Um, because I read it in the Daily Mail. Yeah. <laughs> it must be true. Uh, so, no, no, no. So I've done it, you know, for my own well-being, my own health. Um, you know, all of the all of the men in my family around about my age mm-hmm. start getting, you know, things yeah. falling off and stuff going wrong and everything. Well, just walking along a street and stuff yeah, falling off. Yeah, That's very Should weird. See. Newport's littered with bits of my family. <laughs> the Fuji cast. <laughs> what, what's Merthyr Titful like? <laughs> Don't answer that question. Uh, right. Stuff coming up today, as always, by the way. Um, the, the star of the show is you and your questions. Anything loosely photo-related. Tech is nice. Human is nicer. Uh, the show lives on your questions. Uh, we love to hear from everybody. If you have a question... Um, and if you think they're never going to get read out, look, make it your 2020 resolution. Get on that keyboard now. Send, send, send to click at fujicast.co.uk. And I'm delighted to see a few new names popping in there, which is good. Uh, today we'll hear from James Lawrence, the photographing clergyman. Uh, we're going to get to grips once and for all with this relationship between the clergy and the heathens, a.k.a. us lot. So they say. Passing mention also to the, to the private Facebook group. Thank you very much for popping in there. And um, all the stuff that you've been doing over the last couple of weeks. It's worth a mention with the... Um and we're going to talk about this first of all with the uh, the the one year birthday 
podcast coming up that you can't just leave your name in the the Facebook group. You do have to write in, don't you, Kev? Yeah, you have to go to the contact form on the Futurecast website and just send us a message. And I will reply. I'm going to do a group email to everybody. Everybody, yeah. basically, so far that's that's put their message in. You know, uh, is getting a ticket. Uh, however, we are we're basically at capacity. Are we? Which is crazy. Well, already. Yeah. Oh. Um, there's only a finite, even though it's called the House of Photography and it's, you know, the good ship Fujifilm, there is only a certain amount of space. And additionally, we're going to be doing it when the shop is open. So mm. Ah, that's why there's a slight limit. There's ah. Yeah, and, well, physical space, you know. Yeah, so yeah. We, we, um, yeah, we will have to make a, a decision very shortly to to close up that and um okay. if the only way you're going to be the only way you're going to kind of guarantee your space is is basically by Writing going to the email, contact email. form yeah. and sending us a message and just okay. say get me a ticket please yeah. uh, if you don't hear back from us it means you're on the list if you do hear back from me saying i'm really sorry we're full then take that as meaning i'm really sorry we're yeah. full will there be a uh, I, I guess we'll have a standby list will we or i don't know i mean well, I don't know. It's hard, isn't it? Because it's free question. and, yeah. you know, how many people are actually going to turn up as a free ticket and, you know, some, you know, often people It'd just be like go, wedding dropout rate, you know? 10%. Yeah. Is that... That's my, that's my average. That's what I reckon. 10% people of, won't turn up. Uh, to a wedding? No. Oh, to to our, our party. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like a wedding where everybody turns 10%. up. 10%. Uh, Gemma, uh, I think Sam's coming, right? Yep. Sam's coming. Gemma's coming. Yep. Uh, or she said she's coming, and she might still not. Well, yet, but I've, it all I've depends. heard Jeff Goldblum's in town. Jeff Goldblum. So, so That's she'll it. be there. She'll definitely he's be there. He's staying at the hotel just down the road. Yeah, I think he's coming. He's in the travel lodge. <laughs> no, he wouldn't be in a travel lodge. Mm-hmm. Right? Questions, questions. Um, as always, you go first. Okay. So, uh, firstly, happy New Year to everybody, all of you. Oh, of course, uh, I, know friends. I know we're a couple of weeks in now, but, yeah. but of course, last week and the week before was the uh, the best of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Episode, so, yeah. So, happy New Year. Yeah. I hope you all have a very healthy and happy uh, 2020. Prosperous 2020. Twi- uh, a, vegan, prosperous. a vegan 2020. Mm, you don't have to be vegan. Uh, just because I'm vegan doesn't mean you can be vegan. There too. was a guy also on that on that <laughs> show I listened to who has. Um, who I think is the guy that's going through the courts. He may have already gone through the courts by the time this episode comes out. Oh, was he sacked? Wasn't yeah, he? that guy. Yeah. But I thought one of the interesting things was that he refuses to sit on leather seats and things like yeah. that. Or was that somebody else in the program? Honestly, I mean, listen, it's I, I I totally admire people with principles like that and everything. That's absolutely fine. Um, but I'm doing it just basically to keep my cholesterol in check and my yeah. my 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 own happiness. And I tell you, who else is really happy about you? Uh, you doing this? Uh, Daisy is very happy. Good old Daisy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is from Tom Richardson. He Mm. says, Love the show. I'm a recent convert to Fujifilm after starting out weddings about nine months ago with a Nikon kit. Fantastic experience so far. My question isn't isn't about gear, though. It's about marketing. I did my first string of weddings in the back end of 2018 and made myself a website with a portfolio and social media accounts, etc. I did a small advertising campaign on Facebook around February time and I've managed to pick up about 40 or so, 40 or so weddings what? over the next 18 months. You've just started and you picked up 40. What the? <laughs> That's amazing. That is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Recently, though, I feel like my bookings have dried up <laughs> with what? just the odd one you, you coming in here and there. How many more do you want? What is your advice for effective marketing of your business as a new wedding photographer? How effective are wedding fairs for getting clients? Basically, how do you guys get your work out there in front of couples? And he said, goes on to say, sorry if you've answered this in the recent cast. I'm only up to number eight. Uh, and <laughs> got a long way to go. He has got a long way to go. And actually, we have talked about several of these things in recent episodes. Um, well, it's okay. We can, so we can do this. We again. can. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, you know, we know that people don't typically listen to everything one after the other. They're not hanging on your every word. No. So, mine. well, first of all, uh, a couple of points from here. 40 weddings. Yeah. Is, is in your first yeah. year incredible. or 18 months incredible it is incredible oh. but be very very careful because that's a lot of work mm. a lot of effort a lot of time a lot of family time that's going to go disappear and you just want to be very cautious that you don't burn out in that first couple of years um i did 69 weddings in my second year and it was hell on earth <laughs> absolutely hell on earth and um you know simple fact is 40 weddings in uh, for the next 18 months yes that's reasonable seems reasonable um do you need to be chasing more that's that's the first question i'd be asking is 40 enough 
if it if 40 weddings is uh, is not bringing in you in the income you need in an 18 month period then you need to increase your prices yeah. um shoot less weddings increase your prices better work life balance makes more economic sense and it's you know it's fairer to the industry too so yeah. that's the first thing i would say secondly though is uh wedding fairs i've never done one ever um i can't think of many other things worse for me to do on a sunday <laughs> afternoon than go to a wedding fair and watch some fellow with his meat they pack. Pasty pied fingers okay, flick I, through the albums. For, for the sake of BBC balance, <laughs> um, I'd just like to point out that I do do wedding fairs, and they can be extremely good. I've, I've had some really good bites and bookings mm. from from wedding fairs. Yeah. Um, yeah, it can be frustrating. And the one thing that I, I really dread hearing, the first question is, how much? Yeah. I hate that one, especially yeah. if the H is dropped. <laughs> um, but 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 equally uh, the page turners, you know, the ones that aren't really, yeah. they aren't really listening to you. They're yeah. turning pages, and all they want to say are those two words: how much? Yeah. So or, that they, you you can find frustrate frustrations yeah. through doing them, and some of them can be a bun fight. No, absolutely. I mean, just because I've never done one, I I know I know you do well from them. I know that uh, Sam and Steve Vaughan do very well from them. But you know let's face it it's a personality thing isn't it (laughs) yeah you'd have to use up far too many smiles uh yeah so uh not for me wedding fairs however saying that i always said that facebook marketing was never for me as well kev at a wedding fair so kev come into the wedding fair oh he's off i didn't know a kia could do that (laughs) and my kia could do that at any wedding fair i tell you um (laughs) Uh, but no, absolutely, definitely, wedding fairs can work if you if, yes. you, if you put effort into it and you pick the right wedding fair. Uh, they're much course. harder to get into these days, by the way, because Good. there's <laughs> there, there's <laughs> there's a lot of photographers that want to want to go to wedding fairs. The interesting thing about wedding fairs is you really, if you are going to do them, you have to find a very good reason why you are different. Because price, um, you're going to have a price war in there. Mm. You're always going to have somebody at a table who's got all the gear. They're showing beautiful pictures. Uh, they've they've got um, you know they've got screens going on and all kinds of stuff, and and they're going to be six seven hundred pounds and you're you're seventeen eighteen hundred or whatever. So you need to find something that makes your product different, mm. because price will not work for you at a wedding fair because yeah. they'll just pass on by and go to the cheaper one unless you say ah, but I do this and that doesn't mean that you pile it up with product that you can't afford by the way no or that makes sure which is also a mistake a lot of people make yeah and because if you give away the world on a stick and you know you have this album and then that one for mum and dad and this and that before you know it you're working for three four hundred quid yeah yeah, um, so which a lot of people still do. Think about your offering very, very carefully. I, I mean, I've said this before, and I, I, I'm still convinced of it. I reckon that 80 percent of wedding photographers in the UK, at least, work for less than minimum wage. Mm. If they consider the time that they put into the effort, the shoot time, the marketing time, the editing time, the meetings, the fact that they they probably underprice themselves, and you know, when you split it all up and you look at the hourly rate, it's probably you know flipping burgers in mcdonald's rates so yeah just be just be very careful of that but the other point in uh, tom's email was about the fact that he got those email those weddings from facebook marketing Mm. now in the past i've always been very negative about facebook marketing just um from a from a kind of snobby point of view i suppose in that i didn't think that you know you could market on facebook and get well-paying clients i've still not done it i've still not marketed on Mm. facebook but the fact is you know people are doing it and people are are, you know are getting good stuff out of it so it it clearly works um and you know i would say if if that's where your bookings came from in that 18 month period then that's probably where to target again um well i'm going to surprise you then because i'm i'm going to really chase facebook marketing this year and i'm I'm really going to employ facebook marketing for um in particular launching the the wedding filmmaking part of the business but Mm. also for some photography partly because i read some interesting stuff about demographics recently and um the age group plays reasonably well actually into what are you looking i'm looking for a pen (laughs) have a pen (laughs) are you looking all over i was thinking is he is he smelling something or what's um so where was i yeah partly because i want to launch the the uh, the filmmaking part of the business um, um oh sorry the demographic yeah, the demographic is really interesting it's a slight it's becoming an older demographic that latch onto some of the the, the advertising nick church who was on the show uh, before christmas yeah yep. he's going to help me do it now i'll be reporting back 
um, how, how that goes. Okay, so once you've gone through all of that process, if it works, tell me, <laughs> and then I'll copy it. Uh, if it hasn't worked, still tell me, and then I won't copy it. <laughs> uh, yes. Brilliant. There we go. <laughs> you could be my ABC tester. I am your, yeah, I'm your, I'm your tester for that one. <laughs> All right, thanks, Tom. Your question, yeah. Neil? Uh, well, this isn't so much a question, actually. It's a longish email, but I wanted to start the regular 2020 shows of, you know, where, you know my bit um, with it for reasons that are going to become obvious as I go along. This is from Nicholas White. My wife and I, uh, husband and wife wedding photographers based in Brazil, uh, just down the road from Kev. That's what they call it locally, isn't it? It's not Bristol. Brizzle. 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 Mm-hmm. Brizzle. In Brizzle. fact, you don't even say the S, do you? Brill. Mm. Brill. Silent Zs. Yeah. Pointless. <laughs> just down the road from Kev. He's not pointless. And just wanted to say how much we're enjoying your banter. I've met Kevin a couple of times. I'm sure Kevin chats to loads of people, so I'm not sure he remembers me. I, it was a very brief conversation. I was the one that chatted uh, with Kev about using a GFX for weddings. Do you remember him? Um, was this at the photography show? It could well have been, yeah. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Possibly. I do chat to a lot of people about GFX at weddings, of course, yeah. but I, the, the name rings a bell and the Bristol thing, th- so possibly. Bizzle. We listen to the show uh, whenever there's time to sit down together, but I often listen alone to you guys while I'm out on my 10K morning runs. Oh, you're making me feel guilty straight away. I bet you don't have a, a frequency sounding um, weight. <laughs> <laughs> 10K FM, morning FM frequency. 10K morning run. Brilliant. Oof. I end up giggling loudly in the street, much to the dis- dismay of fellow runners and dog walkers and passers. But on a serious note, um, we lost Catherine's mum to cancer the week before Christmas, and this has been a difficult time for us both. And the festive nativity podcast brought a little light to our lives over Christmas and the new year. They say time is a healer, so we're both taking it one day at a time. We have bookings in the diary for 2020, which is good. Despite an overly saturated market, we've chosen to limit our bookings. This kind of plays back into the last one, doesn't it? Does a bit. To enable us to, to give a more personal, tailored service to our couples and also give us some breathing space for our personal family lives. Uh, but the question, uh, Neil, to ask Kevin is, stand by, please can you get Kevin to say Huawei more on the podcast? <laughs> it's hilarious and brings Catherine out in a fit of giggles <laughs> when he tries to say the name. At the moment, it's hard for Catherine to find a smile. And if Kevin could do this, it might make us all think about how we could put our smile quotas to better use. Best wishes <laughs> to the Murray Wives. Lots of love from, from Nick and Catherine. I'm going to put that in the definitely save that email pile just over there okay well then i will try and say hawaii we we <laughs> more often as much as i can hawaii we we are you gonna get a new hawaii we uh, when are you due for your hawaii update oh not for another 18 months or so i don't p30 think. pro of course p30 do. pro is the next one well we know now you can shoot a wedding on it i'm kind of <laughs> i don't know whether like the whole i have no distrust personally of hawaii um, oh, you're talking about the Chinese sort of taking the, the data uh, thing? Yeah, I'm not fussed about that because no. I've got nothing to hide. However, my, my concern with them as a company is that they, you know, they're over Christmas, I don't know if you read it, they they put out this, this very cryptic message basically saying that the American embargoes on this stuff has affected them massively and right. and Google are still sniffing around saying they're gonna, they might stop um, giving them Android and... So, I don't know, maybe I'll look at something else. Definitely will not be going back to an iPhone, though. Why not? That's for sure. Why not? Oh, the f- the uh, why iPhone not? 11 is amazing. Why piece of not? Kit. Why not? That company. <laughs> oh. I'm, well, I'm not even going to go there. I wish I hadn't asked not this question. Even what, what? Have you ever tried plugging an iPhone into something not made by Apple? It comes up and it well, says. Yeah. You cannot possibly use this. They are the, they should learn a lesson from IBM because when IBM made everybody go proprietary, you couldn't even buy a printer that worked with an IBM computer unless yeah. it had IBM stacked on it. What happened to IBM? That's a very good point. Yes, quite. Mm. Um, so no, I won't be doing that. Anyway, <laughs> that's a that's a whole that's a whole barrage of emails. Hang on, the phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's the director of Apple for you, <laughs> Tim Cook. All right, Tim. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, on the point of that, though, that we, that email we just had, mm. um, I'm fairly sure it was at the photography show. And I think the, it was because I, I edited that a little bit because it was quite a long email. And I'm pretty sure he, he mentioned that show. Right. Which leads me directly into a perfect, perfect plug for the photography show, which I will be doing some talks on the Fujifilm stand. Well, perhaps they haven't actually asked me yet, but hopefully they will. <laughs> um, but I will definitely be doing a talk on the Monday in the behind the lens stand. Oh, well, um, what are you going to say then? Behind the lens stand. 
and find the lens. Come and join me. Um, but the point about it is, I will on the show notes of this episode on the Fujicast website. I will be putting the discount code that I have for the photo show. Oh, right. okay. So if you want to come to the photography show and you want a ten percent discount or free tickets or whatever, I don't know what the discount code does actually. It doesn't give me anything, by the way. But I will. I will link to that on the photography on the Fujicast podcast website oh it's so hard <laughs> how are we, we? <laughs> all right so um morning kevin and neil uh it's amazing how quickly your fantastic podcast has become part of my monday morning my dog gets an extra long walk as i listen to fujicast on my headphones um this is from ali and dundee now we know ali of course now yeah. my, my question to ali is do you want my dog <laughs> oh, I your dog quite is lovely. Happily, I package what, him up. I don't know why you have a problem with him. He's a git. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, you favour the whippet. The whippet. Is I came beautiful. round your place before Christmas. The whippet's allowed to luxuriate on the sofa and and do what the whippet wants to do. While the other one's just sort of like I don't know. He's <laughs> just tearing everything up. <laughs> well, he is. A, <laughs> do you know? I, yesterday, I, I had to buy a new dressing gown because I'm middle aged and you know I'm dressing gown age. Yeah. Um, because my previous dressing gown, which was one of my favourite things Did in my entire it? life, Did yes, he? was in a million pieces. <laughs> Dressing it was the dog what did it not Gemma <laughs> um, anyway Ali goes on to say each week you interview phot- photographers who have risen well above most average photographers uh, what's the secret to photographic and business success do you think is it luck or is it hard work hmm, that's a good question there must be a magical combination of good business sense of photographic skill and hard work to succeed to your level what's the most important quality to have um, from Ali now um, well I suppose success is what you define success as first is the question isn't it it's a very arbitrary thing yeah very arbitrary um you know she says to succeed to your level and i don't know whether she means you and i on that or whether she means the community or the people listening or whether she means the people we interview on the questions yeah um but the meat of it is is it luck or is it hard work Hmm. do you you know i I always think um that luck or, or your your progression in whatever you choose. There, there, there seems to be a long... There's no one thing, is it? There's a long strand of things that... I was thinking about... Somebody asked me this question to do with radio the other day. And I said, well, you know what it all started with? Uh, my dad that used to listen to me in the... In the in the in the kitchen while we were washing up, listening to demo tapes, and then some chap I met, uh, Robbie, at a, a, a hospital radio station, who seemed to think I had. To, and then then he introduced me to something, and then da da da. And, da, and then I, I think I worked out about twelve or fifteen different people I met, and then suddenly one of them happened to be a Radio One um, executive. Mm. And so I think a lot of it is 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 quite it's it's ten particular by nature and you know the, the amount of people you meet the things you do the way you open yourselves up to opportunities i think that's perhaps the most important thing how often have you said oh, i don't want to do that you've done it and then suddenly something else has come from it because you you were just open-minded to it i tell you one thing i've never said tenticular what does that mean? Tentacular. Is it tentacular or tenticular? Tentacular, you said. Oh, I said no. Tenta- I might be tentacular because of tentacles. Well, it's like, like you <laughs> I don't know, know what that means either. Well, it's outreaching, isn't it? It's lots of different <laughs> oh, things. Right, lots okay. of strands. Lots of fair enough. Octopus has has eight um, um, thingies, doesn't it? So. <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> I always it's, used to say it's juggling more stuff in the ocean. You need to be an octopus to put up those um, <laughs> those those travel cots for babies. You need yeah. at least three hands for those. Yeah, you do. And to put um, and then when quilt you just, covers on. Just when you've done it, go boing, all goes back together again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you're right though. I think there's an element of luck uh, for sure in in a lot of things. But you make your own luck, is what I'm yeah, saying. But yeah, you make your luck by being open minded. Fundamentally, it's hard work. And though. Dipping a toe in the water. And, and saying, I will do that. Yeah, but fundamentally it's hard work. Yeah, isn't I, it? I think you so. Know, yeah. You know, you recording all those audio tapes and sending them off, you know, religiously, um, and and eventually you got somewhere, you yeah. know, you, you, you get up at five o'clock every morning and work in the business now and you get your places. Uh, you know, there there are people out there that, that work very hard and perhaps don't succeed, but I think there's more people that, uh, you, you know, that there are, there are some people who are just, you know, pretty much lazy and expect things to happen for mm. them, mm. Um, especially in the social media world. You know, um, 
we all know people who... I think people have become conditioned to that, haven't they? Yeah. Why it, aren't I an influencer? Yeah. Why don't I have 20,000 followers? That kind of thing, you know. And I, They're rubbish compared to me. I should have that. Uh, I've had, you know, I've had my fair share of emails from people who are like, uh, you know, can, can you put... Sometimes not even like, hi, Kevin, really like your work. You know, just uh, can you put me in touch with the marketing executives at Fujifilm? Yeah. I, I'm currently using Nikon, <laughs> but I think I can, you know, I, I think I can uh, You bring a lot of followers to their brand. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, you know what? And it's like, no, work, do do what I did, which is work hard. And and yes, an element of luck plays its part, but but ultimately, I think hard work is the most important thing. Um, you know, and of course, if the luck comes, then great. There's nothing negative about luck, um, especially of a tentacular nature. <laughs> tentacular. I don't know. <laughs> tentacular. I had some good advice actually, very very early on in. Um, uh, in the broadcast career, which was be a bigger fish in a smaller pond rather than trying to aim always at the, I've got to be up there. That's where I need to be. I need to be an ambassador for, for a photographic brand. I need to be this, that. I need to have my pictures on walls in, in the Tate. Just uh, be, a, be, a, be a bigger fish in a smaller pond to start with mm. and, and you'll get noticed if your work is good enough and, yeah. and if you're the right kind of person. No, absolutely perfect, that is. And, you know, I've said this before as well. I think if, you, if one of your ambitions is to be a brand ambassador, yeah. then the chances are it won't happen because you will approach it the wrong way. It should be, you know, it should be something that comes through... Um, Hard work, effort, luck, whatever. Well, it's very but much what Ian, Wil- Wil- um, um, Ian McDonald. Wilkinson, sorry, Ian McDonald. Sorry, Ian. Ian McDonald said in, in last week's um, uh, Best of Part Two when we played, yeah. he, he was saying exactly that as a Canadian ex photographer. Mm-hmm. He was saying, you know, he can't, he can't aim to be it. No, you know, that's that's not no, the, that's not the game. It's a reward for graft. Not not a um, not no. something you should just uh, yeah. just have. However, I also on a similar kind of note, I remember having a conversation with Bill Gates once. Believe it or not, really? <laughs> yeah. Clang. And um, I, when I used to work at Microsoft, did you ask him for some so, a loan? Yeah, no. For a fiver? <laughs> no, I told that story as well. I'm not telling that story again. It was the other way around. Still owes it to me. Um, but I I um, I remember him saying. Actually, it wasn't a conversation with him. In fairness, it was at the company meeting. Right. And and he said something that I'll always remember. He said, how can you expect people to be confident in you if you're not confident in yourself? Mm. Um, which I thought was interesting because essentially the point of the the whole kind of um, conversation, if you like, the, that that element of the of the meeting that we were all having was that, you know, you have to have this this perceived um, ambition, this perceived strength. And, you know, if you're if you're seen to be, uh, you know, a little bit weak or meek or whatever in the way that you're dealing with clients and mm. customers, then, you know, how can you expect them to, you know, to be confident in it's you? A, it's, a, it's a fine line. It's a balancing act, isn't it? Because you don't want to come across as arrogant, uh, ignorant. Mm. And sometimes if you're overconfident, th- th- those, you know, you've got to be a very unique kind of person to have absolute confidence and not come across as an arrogant so-and-so. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the point I was trying to make with that is things like, you know, when you're looking at your own work and stuff like that, and, you know, we all we all look at our work and think, oh, I wish it was better. But, you know, does that message come across? You know, is that something that you, you, you know, your, your kind of persona is passing over? Mm. Um, so yeah, that that kind of stuff. Do, but, do you think it's become the ultimate thing for a photographer to achieve now? As a, a new photographer, is, is this because it, it didn't <laughs> years ago? It didn't exist. I think Jeff Askoff was the first uh, photographic ambassador that I I, I, I suppose it, I suppose if you look right back, Bailey was a kind of an ambassador with Olympus, wasn't he? But but it, it, it seems to be a kind of a modern thing, really, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's grown up with the social media world, hasn't it? Mm. Um, I guess and. I don't know. I, I I think there's very few people who actually think that's my objective, mm. but there are certainly people out there who are you use use that as a kind of um, gateway to you know to their defined perceived success, and it shouldn't be. Mm. It shouldn't be at all. I'm mm. not. I'm not suggesting as well that you have to have to do unpaid work, but I think you know so so of my greatest um personal greatest successes and then may not be uh, successes in other people's eyes have have come from when i've been so passionate about something i know passionate is an overused word these days but but then it's it's become it's migrated it's become something else i, mean, I think this podcast is one of those really because mm-hmm. i think for all those people that that think we make any money out of this um this has been almost a year of absolutely free work Hours and hours of editing, 
you spend a lot of your time and energy travelling up and down <laughs> motorways to be at the, the studio and, and your presence here. And the website, and yeah, and 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 <laughs> and are you going to get a word in edgeways? Uh, uh, <laughs> and but, but but I had my audible. Uh, they sent you on the, on New Year's Eve. They sent you your stats from the previous year. Yeah, last year I listened to thirty nine books. Did you? Very good. Yes. Oh, all, all on your trips here? Coming here mostly, yeah. No, no, 39 books. Um, I've been part of your education. <laughs> yeah. But but the but the other thing I wanted to say was um, some of you have noticed that we did um, put the tip jar on the website. Yeah. And you have been incredibly gracious with your donations. And so uh, this afternoon, Neil and I are going to Bermuda. <laughs> and uh, you can you can do what you want with the podcast. Are the car's ready. Here we go. We're off. <laughs> Um, no, every penny does help, um, of course, and especially things like the birthday party in London. Yeah, the money, uh, goes, the money goes to that, not to, not yeah, to the army. Yeah, 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 because we, sure. we have to pay for that, which is uh, rightly so. And so, um, you know, we will, we, we will, all of that money will be yeah. reinvested into your personal uh, can I, fun. Can I just po- so point out as well, but we didn't actually discuss this. At the at the party, uh, Kev's under the, the illusion that we're going to have to buy everybody a drink. I think 75 to 80 people buying them drinks uh, will go out of business. But, but we'll, we'll provide the cake. You provide your own your own drinks, and we'll provide the entertainment and conversation. Mm. No, I'm not, not sure. Agree with I that. don't agree because what? they won't. No, no please, oh, no. 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 no, no, no. They're not going to be able to bring their own drinks into the house of photography. That's, true. that's, well, that's for a, sure. That's a sober place. Just, yeah. yeah. Anyway, question. Um, Hen, as in Henry, how do you both go about networking when it comes to photography, professionally and informally? The podcast has, has a perfectly relaxed feel to it, so I thought it would be a perfect place to ask. The biggest thing I struggle with is feeling a bit lonely when it comes to the hobby. My girlfriend only has so much patience on days out when I find a composition I like, so I feel I need to, to meet people with similar interests, but I'm struggling a bit with this. Bouncing ideas off like-minded people and getting honest thoughts on my shots would really help me as I, I really want to try and make a career out of this from Henry. How would you go about networking like that? Uh, it's just something that happens typically, isn't it? You know, you, you kind of put yourself in positions. We, You know, for example, we're doing the party for the uh, the meetup. There'll be a lot of people who are coming, not not necessarily to listen to us, but to, to meet other photographers. Uh, you know, social media, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, sp- I, I, cam- I never really think... What about think- camera clubs? Was where we're getting feedback. Yeah, camera clubs. Yeah, I, I, I never forums. Uh, you forums, can, specific forums. Yeah, I mean things like SWPP, all of that kind of stuff. I, I don't know. It's it's like a. There's a lot of stuff you can do. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any kind of um, benchmark or or kind of principle in place networking i don't for example i, I never do those um breakfast meeting clubs no. that people seem to do although some people do very well yeah and no, I'd, I'd point out that uh, there's several um breakfast meeting clubs that that really helped when i started my business locally photographically mm. because um they wanted all kinds of stuff mm. you know, they wanted portraits business portraits business pictures and did you have to do those for free or did you get business back from somebody else well the one i belong like to, a barter system yeah the one i belong to is very much a barter system so you you expected to bring leads so that 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 can be a little bit uh and that's a bit of a pressure but but it, it kind of worked good 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 <laughs> that's the end of networking <laughs> chat from kevin mullins <laughs> right let's go for this week's interview um just before Christmas, I, I told that story about the vicar that that uh, said if he came back, he only wanted to come back as two things, either a cat because it would get him nine lives, or if he really wanted to upset people, he'd come back as a wedding photographer um, if, he re- if he really wanted to be disliked, which I thought was uh, fairly cynical. And um, uh, but, but just before that, actually, I'd had a, an opportunity to talk with this chap. James Lawrence is a particularly pertinent photographer when it comes to talking about the attitudes of the church towards us and us towards it. And whilst I appreciate not everybody who listens to this is um, into weddings or or wants to ever shoot one, I think James makes an interesting story of only uh, for some of the anecdotes and ideas he shares when it comes to how we as photographers are perceived by the wider world. And it also turns out that James knows a thing or two about organising trips to Iceland, photographic trips, which we'll uncover. So why is James pertinent? Because he was ordained and now works with the Church of England uh, in an advisory and training capacity when it comes to clergy. He has direct contact with those that we deal with as photographers. 
He talks to them about communication, not necessarily about photography, yes, but, but communication as a whole. In my experience with dealing with clergy is always very fleeting. I've shot personally 800 weddings, smidge more maybe, and I'd have to sit down with a spreadsheet to really break down which ones were in church, but the opportunity to talk for slightly longer than the one minute you usually get about the subject of being banished to the back was not one I wanted to miss. So James, we actually heard from you for this one in that a month or two ago, both myself and Kevin were, were pondering the, the idea that any C of E vicars might be listening. And then lo and behold... You pop up. Um, so that's that's proof that you do. I'm I'm assuming though you you listen because you're a photographer, not not because you're uh, you're involved in the Church of England. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a Fuji photographer, um, sort of amateur, uh, involved in a variety of different ways. Um, do a little bit of training of uh, others in photography, um, but love it. Now you're you're ordained, um, but there, there's two sort of there's two wings, if you like, to your um, this sort of angelic fashion, um, to, to the way you work. <laughs> on on the one hand, you're training vicars, and on the other hand, you're training photographers. Let, let's let's take the vicars first. What are you training them in? I've been ordained now 32 years. Can't quite believe it's that long. Um, but I train vicars in really trying to think through how to lead churches in the world we find ourselves in today, which of course is a world in which the majority of the country's population have little or no connection these days with church at all. So it's a fascinating job and gets me all over the country. Now, I'll, I'll not be so bold um, or, of course, self-absorbed to think that wedding photography <laughs> is or should be mentioned in any of your training. But in, yeah. in your chats with those that you train, I mean, you've, you've mentioned that you talk about the modernisation of church. Do you talk yeah. at all about image and photography as, whole, as a whole, May, maybe in context of, um, of social media? Yeah, so we actually do do some stuff around social media, although I have to confess I've never done anything specifically on wedding photographers. <laughs> maybe that's something I need to address in the future. <laughs> yeah. um, but the stuff around social media is very important um, because, of course, how um, uh, many people now, if they're going to find out about a local church will do so online rather than actually visiting it so church's social media presence is is an important part of how they think about how to present themselves in their communities today did you hear us talking about um, how how wedding photographers are perceived in church it was it was that conversation that you contacted yeah, us was, yeah okay it was. And, I, and, and on one hand i want to apologize for all those wedding photo to all those wedding photographers who have had bad experiences of vicars uh, i'm really sorry that that's been the case because that certainly wouldn't be my wish um i i'd love to see wedding photographers and clergy working well together both professionals trying to provide a really good service on a on a very special day for people but but in terms of balance of course um it, it wouldn't be fair to allow you to apologize with, without me coming back and saying I'm, I'm sure there's some of my flock if you if we use that <laughs> that expression that that um entirely misrepresent what we do as well i think yeah and, yeah, and no, i want there are. and i want and, and it's often um what we would call friends with cameras uh our experience sometimes is that folks uh um particularly for top non-professional photographers are sometimes the ones who maybe don't help uh, the photography side of things what do you think photographers can do to help themselves when they go into a church and i know i have my way james and yeah. that might be helped by a, 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 a maturity the fact that i i don't you know I, i'm not a, an 18 19 20 year old that that may yeah. be perceived wrongly to be you know the type that might climb all over the pews to get their shot and i, yeah. I think yeah. that age and maturity sometimes helps and i think sometimes when you go into a church the way you dress can help you, for example, as well. But what, what do you think can help photographers to do their job um, and, and trying to avoid being sent to the back that, like they're a naughty schoolboy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I was thinking about that ahead of this uh, conversation. And I, I basically have come up with six things as I've reflected on both being a photographer myself and a, being a clergy person. I thought of six things that I think that might might help photographers as they approach a sort of wedding okay. in a Church of England context. Um, the first of them is um, uh, to talk to the couple about talking to the vicar beforehand to find out w what the vicar normally thinks is acceptable, permissible uh, in, in, in the service. Because if the couple have done that, then actually you'll be a lot more aware as a photographer. That's, that's a good point. Two. Second one is um, to talk to the vicar yourself. Um, now, I, I do know some photographers who turn up at the rehearsal and 
Uh, actually, that's a, a good thing as far as I'm concerned, because what that does, it gives me and the photographer unpressured time to just chat through how's it going to work, what's what's going to work well for both you and and uh, the photo for me and for the photographer. I think most pickers uh, want to work well with the photographer. I hope all do, but I, uh, most certainly do. Um, and and therefore, just that relational contact beforehand will be a good thing to do. I've also also found that using particular words is quite handy. Solemnity seems to be a word that vicars quite yeah. like to hear. Um, yeah. If yeah. you go in yeah. there and say, "Look, I I understand the solemnity of this occasion," that's a great word. But to use. but, but yeah. where can you? And an open question, I, I've uh, often asked. But where can I get the best? shots um, because if somebody too. then says go to the back you're you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. where can i get the best shots the really good ones um that doesn't always work having said that um right. but but that, right. I, I found that in relation to what you're talking about with that point okay th- three third I'm, i mean i'm fascinated by these third point my third one actually relates to what you've just said neil um because i think it's about respecting the ceremony as an act of worship and i think if you can indicate that you recognize it as such for the word you've chosen is solemnity that would be a good one um then i think that would that helps the vicar to understand that you understand what's going on in the context of that service. I mean, it's not a photo shoot, as we all know. And I heard a terrible story of one photographer who, who tried to get the, well, invited the bride to lay on the, um, well, what I would call the communion table, some place you would call the altar, during the service for a photo. Really? Uh, and I just, yeah, really, honestly. See, I, I, honestly. Do, I do wonder whether these are, uh, uh, and I'm sure I'm sure that they're, uh, they're, they're truthful. They, they can't. <laughs> They can't not be, but I wonder whether they've been touched by Chinese whispers because right. I, I so often hear the story of, well, last week this photographer came in with, uh, I know where it's going before we've even started. Don't tell yeah. me it's got to be a, a white Canon type 70 to 200 millimeter lens and they rested it on your shoulder, right? Uh, and yeah, the, ar- yeah. the answer will invariably be. What I yes, did was yes. I actually contacted, I'm a part of a community of clergy, and I contacted a whole bunch of these folks and said, Give me your best and worst stories of wedding photographers. So the ones I'm offering you are from from folks that I know who have experienced these things. Uh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, and it, it did to the exception because there were lots of great stories of working really well with wedding photographers. So it is the exception. But, of course, you and I know that it's the exception that sadly ruins it for everyone. Yeah, because then that um, goes into what, whatever your equivalent of the church Radio Times is, and it goes, goes yeah. does, does beats the jungle drum. And before you know it, every yeah. vicar, every clergyman is, is then running that one back at you as an excuse for you yeah. not to do your job. Absolutely. And it works the other way around, because, of course, um, there are plenty of stories, sadly, uh, of clergy who have just not treated photographers Mm. well. And that then makes the photographer concerned, suspicious, uh, not necessarily um, uh, uh, sure about how best to approach figures. So it's it's both ways around. We've been guilty of poor behaviour as well Um, as some photographers. What happened with the the bride who was asked to essentially well, lay back on the altar but thankfully the bride said no and the clergy person yeah. definitely said no. I, I, should, I should think so too yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so your fourth point just an encouragement i think to photographers to remember that the vicar is coordinating multiple things and as and and the photographer is just one of them you know they're coordinating the fact that the organist has just arrived and and just told uh, the vicar that this week their mother has been diagnosed with terminal cancer they're they're juggling with the fact that the groom is so nervous that he's been swigging rather too much whiskey outside and has walked in half drunk. They're, they're coordinating the fact that the mother and the father of the bride won't sit together because they have been divorced for a long time and it wasn't a sort of a good divorce. Uh, they're coordinating the fact that Uncle John has just arrived and set his tripod up in the front pew or little Inge has just lost his toy down the church heating grill and he's screaming the place down. And the vicar's also working with the fact that they they can be nervous as well. Uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I still get nervous when I'm doing a wedding because it's such an important occasion. Yeah, that's interesting. And, yeah, I've never thought yes, of that before. Yes, yeah. because have, you know, bad days as well. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so just to remember, we're human too. Okay. Fifth uh, point. I mean, this is an interesting one. I've been, I'm interested to know what you think of this, Neil. I, I always like to see if the, if the um, couple would be prepared to encourage the family and friends not to take the photos during the service because I think that makes it easier for you as the photographer, easier for the vicar, and also I think it gives the couple a better experience of the occasion. Now, I don't know what you do about that. Do you have a particular line on that? I'm, I'm quite relaxed on people using cameras in church. 
and, okay. and by that I mean on the rece- on the recessional um, and the processional, this idea yes. that you stop people taking uh, photographs. Um, sometimes it has been used, not not just by vicars. I'm, I'm talking about uh, about registrars as well, who've who've often yeah. used the word. We've got the professional here today, so the rest of you lay off your cameras, and then you yeah. get uh, you get a hundred eyes that fall on you, as if you've made that dictate that, that you've made that rule. And yeah. so sometimes I, I feel that can make my job harder in in, right. in letting people understand that I, you know, I'm I'm part of it, not not yeah. the ringmaster. Um, yeah. So that that yeah. can be that can be awkward. But I agree with you that I think that there's you know, if you go to church, uh, it, it it occurs to me that you know, good manners is to watch your best friends getting married, not not to not to be taking yeah. lots and lots of pictures. And I never quite understand, apart from maybe mum and dad and, and grandma or somebody or sis or brother. Um, yes. What they're going to be using these pictures for? I, I'm I'm yeah, I'm yeah, a bit perplexed yeah. by that. You know, we're friends. Yeah, no, I I get that as well. And I think I, I mean at the end of the day, I think it's it has to be the couple's decision about this. But but the thing I think I would want to say to them is, do you know what? Uh, wouldn't it be lovely as you walk down the aisle, either way, going in or coming out, mm. that that everyone was looking at you and focused on you and not looking at you through a screen? I think in that communication with a vicar beforehand, um, sometimes I would also suggest to uh, couples to suggest to the vicar um if yeah. this is if this is true that the photographer has x amount of experience and um and i i do keep in my bag this this might seem a little bit forward but i do keep in my bag an a4 sized um pastiche of pictures on 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 one print to show what i mean about um, mm-hmm. getting the angle and and uh, and particularly usually quite emotional pictures where the vicar i'm talking to can understand oh i yeah i see what you're getting to i think that's a great idea because i think for lots of vicars who are not photographers they don't quite understand uh, find it hard to conceive of what you're really looking to take and to be able to show them the things i think the vicar then gets a much easier right oh okay i see what you're after yeah, I just think if they have time, then that can be a, a useful tool. Right, sixth point. I think the last thing I want to say is, um, why don't don't you thank the vicar at the end? And I think the reason for that is it leaves them with a good feeling, the vicar, and it sets them up well for the next photographer at the next wedding because mm. they've had a good experience of you as a photographer and therefore they're going to be a bit more positive about well, that was a nice chap, hopefully, uh, or girl. Uh, uh, hopefully, the next one will be equally nice. In your feed, um, uh, in your feedback, is that fairly national? Do do C O V uh, vicars read your um, uh, what you send out? So I G- generally, um, generally, uh, so I a number of yeah. So I have a number of sort of um, things that I'm involved in. I, I write a monthly thing for about six and a half thousand, um, not just clergy but leaders within churches uh, um, uh, around the country. Um, but I also produce resources and write books, and then I have a Facebook community that, that are a bunch of people who've been through a particular leadership program that I'm a part of. So that's often a place where I can try things out and uh, find out people's opinions and ideas on different things. So it's a whole range of different sort of networks that i'm a part of well I'm, the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning it and it doesn't have to be me i'm not putting myself forward i wouldn't be so arrogant as to do that but uh, it might be a nice idea if you if you have any guest spots within these yeah. these things that you write for somebody from um, the the photographic community um, yeah. to actually write about their experiences and, and share their thoughts and, and so maybe you get more maybe the clergy will then get a, a second side of the story as, as i'd be to- delighted if you do that i just also wonder whether uh photographers could give to the couples um their sort of code of conduct to give to the clergy person when they first meet with the clergy person and it can explain look i'm hiring a professional photographer and uh, this is their code of conduct uh, just want you to know it's not you know uncle uncle john with his camera he's going to be doing all sorts of inappropriate things because i think that also well ahead of the occasion will just help the clergy person sort of relax into oh, okay th- th- this is somebody who knows what it's going to happen and they're going to think carefully about how they behave and I, I actually had to go at writing what that code of conduct might be so you might want to write your stuff i'll send you mine and then we can share best practice both ways you know i think i think that's an amazing idea i'd be very interested to receive that uh, yeah. and and then i'll have a go at writing my own and we, we can uh, perhaps exchange that on the the show and we'll we'll make a feature of that and you as the listener okay. listening right now can um can tell us what you think as well so um in terms of your own photography it's a particular mm. passion of yours i, I know you reconnected it w- with it some nine years ago i read 
And now, yeah. now you're not just making pictures, but you're training too in, in photography and, and in amazing places like Iceland, I might add, which, yeah. which for m- most photographers has become sort of the, the bucket list place to photograph, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is stunning. I absolutely love it. Um, and it really came about from a, um, a trip that I went on uh, some years ago. I took my mum to Iceland after my father had died. And um, I'd just come off a, a couple of photography workshops that I'd been on myself and hadn't found them as helpful as I had hoped they would be. And as I was on the flight back from Iceland, I thought, well, I wonder if I could I wonder if I could offer a, a trip to Iceland that, that would be of interest to others. And so I, I did my first one in um, 2016, I think it was, and I've been going uh, 2018, 2019, and going again next year. Uh, and it's just, it combines things that I love. I love teaching and training. I love photography. I love travel. So it's just a great opportunity and so, a lot of fun to do. So the love of photography training has clearly come out the fact uh, that you, you love training the clergy. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. It combines sort of my my sort of uh, work skills, if you like, with my hobby and uh, interest. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just one of those lovely sort of uh, ways that things have come together in a creative way. There's a difference, of course, between because you also teach workshops uh, in the Midlands, yeah. uh, the location for those and the tours, because you, you've got the, 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 the workshops are UK based, aren't they? And the tours are very much get on an aeroplane jobs. Yes, yes. And I've, uh, the, the workshops um, are, are based sort of in the Birmingham, sort of Oxford area, which is where I'm based. And then the tours, I've only been to Iceland. I'd love to go further afield, but at the moment, Iceland is the one that I have the sort of time mm. and experience to do. And that dovetails actually very nicely with going on a photography tour. Your guide to everything you need to know, 10 steps to prepare for your mm-hmm. journey. You seem to be a man that likes likes lists and steps. So, <laughs> yes, which, which, is a, which is a good thing. Um, but but actually, that underlines extremely well the fact that you, you say that planning is imperative. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, you ask the question of people going on expensive f- photography tours or journeys, whether, whether it'll be worth the investment, which I thought was very honest. Mm-hmm. Is that because yeah. you think that people just don't plan and they wing it too much? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and there are so many different types of tours out there. It's really important for people just to think through, well, so what am I looking for from this tour? And to find out what does the tour actually offer? Um, again, that was partly through my own experience of, of being on a couple of photography tours. So the reason I wrote the guide was actually, I think, um, there are some very basic things that somebody thinking about going on a photography tour can do to maximise the likelihood of them having the experience they want to have, learning what they want to learn, engaging in a way which is going to be helpful for them. Do you know that leads uh, <laughs> on to the last note I made here? Ask James, does he get time to take it? <laughs> To take his own pictures that's a great question <laughs> yes um, i set up a photography club actually some years ago online with a bunch of friends yeah. and uh, the reason for doing that was just how easy it is in the business of life to end up not taking any photos so we have a monthly project that we um set ourselves uh, which involves uh, making sure that we take some photos around the theme um uh, but it is a great danger isn't it you can spend I mean, life is busy anyway, um, and I enjoy helping others learn how to take photos, but but actually, if I'm not careful, I end up not taking enough mm. photos myself. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's the yeah. danger. Well, James, it's been fascinating uh, talking to you. This is not the end of our journey because you've almost set us a task now um, to think about. I'd love to send through uh, a few thoughts about about a sort of potential code of conduct, and I'd love to hear from you and other photographers about how you would like um, Vickers to approach photographers in a better way so that hopefully together, Vicar and photographer, um, we can, as I say, make this a great experience for the couple for whom ultimately this is all about uh, by working well together um, as we as we engage with them and engage with one another. My thanks to James Lawrence for his time on the show this week. You can read more about him as you can indeed with all our guests if you visit the show notes page at fujicast.co.uk on the episode's list page big year ahead when it comes to chatting with folk on the podcast there are uh, lots of plans this year for some interview you've got some great you've got some corkers actually um lined up haven't you i'm planning them yeah, yeah I'm getting there can you tell us anything about them uh, at, the, at the moment how about new oh right okay no it's all top secret <laughs> okay top secret there's some good names coming up mm. uh, and but also by the way if you have a story to tell yourself um then uh, we'd love to hear from you as well because um I, I think that's the d- democracy of the 
the whole thing is it's not just about famous photographers it's about you and what you're doing and how you can inspire others as well so, yeah and we try and have guests on that aren't necessarily superstars click at fujicast.co.uk if you yeah. have some suggestions absolutely okay okay so i have a uh, question um now this is this came in a while back i think i can't i'm not sure exactly when but i, th- I think it's been hanging around for a while and it's okay. from uh, mark savoy in canada savoy 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 <laughs> Mark Savoy. So it must be French, mustn't it? In Canada. Mark Savoy. Savoy. Savoy? S A V O I E. Oh, I don't know. Not Just ask, ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so he goes on to say i wonder what your opinion on richard prince is working uh, mm. i recently came across time's list of the hundred most influential photos of oh. his um and the, the piece is called cowboy untitled cowboy yeah. was included um he goes on to say the podcast is usually about technical side of photography i thought mm. it'd be nice to hear your thoughts on a topic like this thanks again mark Savoy from <laughs> vancouver in canada so uh, maybe it's worth describing the picture R- richard prince I will embed all of this into the picture yeah. and, and any other kind of um, yeah. related content into the Futurecast notes on the website. So it all goes back, really, to a guy called Sam Abel, doesn't it, this, really? Because Sam Abel did a picture for Marlborough? I think it was Marlborough. Marlborough. Yeah. Um, yes, it was Marlborough. And and he, he made the picture of the cowboy on the running horse. Mm. And that was the, you know... Very iconic picture. Yeah, yeah Very absolutely. Iconic. And then what did Richard Prince do? So my understanding is that Richard Prince basically cro- took re- re-photographed it, right. essentially, and sold it and made a lot more money than Sam Abel did um, out of that. And Actually, let me look that up my, while you're reading that. I'm fairly sh- I'm 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 99% ac- sure that that's an accurate assumption that oh, Richard Prince yeah. rephotographed Sam Abel's picture and I'm only talking about this cowboy picture all right so the cowboy picture that time chose as 100 most influential photos of uh, of of their time of our generation was a rephotograph of Sam Abel's picture now if you look at Sam Abel's picture it's a rephotograph picture, or an edit or a crop uh, I don't know whether it's... I found, it looks identical it to does. me. I found the bit on, on Wikipedia. Richard Prince, born 49, American painter, photographer. Mid-70s, he made drawings and painterly collages that actually he's since disowned. He began <laughs> copying other photographers' work in 77. His image, the untitled cowboy one, which we're talking about, uh, a, a re-photographing of a photograph. Oh, it's a re-photographing of... Oh, maybe he photographed the photograph. Yeah. Now, we had a conversation well, similar Abel. to this before, didn't we? Do you know how much he earned from that, by the way? Well, it, was some it was the first millions. re-photograph to be sold for more than $1 million at auction mm. at Christie's, New York, in 2005, regarded as one of the most revered artists of his generation. So this comes down to, well, should Sam Abel's picture be the one that was in the Time 100 Most Iconic Pictures? Yeah. Um, is is I have time included um, Richard Prince's one as most iconic because of the circumstance rather than the uh, artistic yeah, merit. I think that's probably it. Yeah. Um, is he right to do it? Who knows? But we did have a conversation a few months back. I'm sure about, uh, and I said that I wasn't sure what the the legalities are about reproducing work like paintings and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe that this is how how the legalities of all that stuff started. Who knows? Um, I will, there's an interview with Sam Abel that I will um, I will embed in the, Actually, in the I've website. Just found too. A bit. Sa- Sam Abel talks about Richard Prince, I suppose, ab- about about using his photograph. So it seems to be breaking to me the golden rule, and that's a higher law than the law of art or commerce. That's the ultimate law, and he has to live with that. What I sense about him is that he can live with it, and uh, that's. A greater achievement than anything. Oh, what a sense of that is Sam Abel's not very happy about it. No, but he's well impressed with Richard Prince's arrogance. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying. Are you going to put that film up for uh, people? Yeah, I'll embed that okay, film, right, yeah. Right. Um, so, yes, uh, in fairness, I, I, I'm, both the pictures are amazing, obviously, very iconic, but, you know, yeah. you, you, only you can choose your um, ethical mm. opinion of it all. So, right, thank you for that, uh, Mark Sabwa. From friend of the show, James Sauls, I just listened to the Business of Photography's podcast on Freedom Edits. Oh, yes, I know of them. Mm, They're in Cardiff. Yes. 
Uh, they provide uh, culling and editing services. Uh, I'm thinking about using them on an ad hoc basis at 25 pence a photo. Is this an advert for them? Hang on. <laughs> I should edit this. I've never used them in fairness, so I don't. I, I do know people that use them, and they're, they're, they're meant to be pretty okay, good. Well, James says, next year I leave my nine-to-five uh, day job in management uh, to start photography full-time. I mean, it's later this year. It's April. Uh, 60% of my income will come from weddings, 40% in doing taxiing work around my photography business to fill the cash gap while I grow. Well, that's... Um, industrious? Industrious, yes. I've made a few mistakes already, and I've not even quit the day job yet. You want to get a sat-nav. Get a sat-nav. <laughs> They'll stop all of those mistakes. I don't think he means those mistakes. And I've never even... yet to see a bear on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> Such as overbooking August on certain <laughs> weeks. And I know that I'll have a knock-on effect. It'll have a knock-on effect when it comes to li- delivering the pictures. Currently, I have 13 weddings in August 2020 alone. What are we doing wrong, Kev? All these 13? <laughs> 13. Yeah. Anyway, my question. If I pull on the service of a film um, like F- Freedom Edits, either as and when needed, or possibly even for every wedding shot, does that devalue me? Does it make me a lesser photographer? Is it cheating? Would I become scorned by the larger community? And ultimately, am I doing right by my customers? I'm thinking I can cull and they can edit when time has pushed my end. The firm seems good, etc., etc., etc. What do you think? Well, I... Um, I have no problem with it at all. No, I have, absolutely. For so many years, um, I used a retoucher well, yeah. all the time. No, no, I, I I don't do it myself personally, but I know people that have do it, including yourself. And, yeah, I don't... I think that these, these companies... Uh, like I said, I've never, I've never used Freedom Edits, although I've met them on mm. several occasions. I think that they work with you to find a style that, that is, you know, reminiscent of, of how you deliver your pictures as well. So you're not just getting some random person putting a standard preset and all your pictures are going to look yeah. like everybody else's. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if that's if that's what you need to do, you know, to get your sanity back, then absolutely. However, I think I think the source of the problem here, James, is is your over, overload of work rather than, than that. You know, don't... I don't know. I've, I, I, I may be completely barking up the wrong tree, of course, which I often do. Woof, woof. Um, <laughs> but I would suggest that if you're panicking about this already and you've got 13 weddings in August alone, double your price. Double your price and shoot seven weddings in yeah. 2021. It's simple economics. You know, your work-life balance is far more important than your cash flow. Certainly, don't, don't just chase the numbers. And also, don't... Um, and again, I'm not assuming you're doing this, but... Uh, if somebody on Facebook says, I've got 60 weddings this year, uh, don't necessarily believe them. Um, it might be true, might not be true, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a little bit like I went on a speed awareness course recently. So I'm going off on a tangent here. Stand by. Warning, warning. <laughs> He's off on a tangent. I went on a speed awareness course and, uh, and the fella was saying, um, he kept asking us, so what's the fastest you could go on a motorway? Well, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and everybody was like 70 miles an hour and he went no no stop saying say. he was getting really angry he was said he? it's the national speed limit oh. NSL to us he right. would say uh, so 70 miles an hour just happens to be the national speed limit yes. it doesn't mean that 70 miles an hour is always going to be the national speed limit no. and he was going on and on and on and on and he, what he said was the national speed limit is not a target it's a recommendation oh. of your maximum speed mm. Um, so uh, yes, so don't don't just chase. The more weddings you book, does not necessarily mean it's going to be better for you. Uh, adjust your. Oh, economics. I see your analogy now. I was trying to work. I'm getting out there. Where, I know. Where, where this I, know going. I know. I know. No. 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 See, that's um, that's the vegan in me. You know, just kind of go off on all these tangents. I've got all this extra energy in me now. I know. I can tell. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, James. I would. Uh, if you're panicking about that stuff already, then think about what's causing those panics in the first place but to answer your question about freedom edits and all of the other editing type yeah. places then uh, yeah absolutely if it helps do it, do it. Oh, there are many many photographers in, 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 in I know a few in the fashion world that have actually don't even know how to use Photoshop or Lightroom to do any real skill level oh absolutely um, it's yeah. just not what they want to do there are some fashion photographers that I know that actually don't do their own lighting. And the other they th- don't know how to do it. Uh, yeah, uh, of course, and because they're pure photographers. But the other thing about this is that, you, you know, I often, and I'm not saying that this is, again, your case, James, because I don't know at all, but often the people that I, I have come across that end up using these types of tools, uh, so these types of businesses, are ones that end up shooting like 10,000 pictures at a wedding. Yeah. 
Um, and rightly or wrongly, that's entirely up to them. But that could be something that you would just also to think actually, you know, shoot less, deliver more, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, okay. But whatever, you know, good question though. All right, um, yours. Okay, this is from Jans or Jans. Jans. From El Guria. How do you spell that? F R O M O W hyphen G U E R R A. G U E R I A. Guru? Guru. 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 From Mexico. Guru. 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 Jans. We'll go with that. Yeah, we'll just call you Jans from Mexico. Well done, Jans. Could be Jans. Um, <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> Hi, Neil and Kev. Uh, your show has turned out to be my favourite of all podcasts oh. I listen to. Yada, 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 It might yada, not be yada, now yada, that we, yada, we yada, made a real yada. hash of your yes, name. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, two questions. Um, number one, I shoot raw and fine sometimes. I like the possibility to have from the camera different film simulation options, so mm. I use film simulation bracketing mode. I've also tuned some... Film simulation bracketing mode. Yes. Right, okay. So that's where you can choose. I'll have Acros plus Classic Chrome plus standard and you press a button it uh, dum, records dum, dum. three yeah. pictures okay well, i've never used that um no, no i've also turned uh, sorry i've also tuned some custom settings with some tweaks similar to kevin's oh, okay. and martin parr setting and other types of simulation styles too is there a way to bracket those tweaked film simulations already set in custom settings yeah. and the answer yans or jans is no Oh. I'm very sorry. It's something that we've requested many times, <laughs> but the short. answer is no. <laughs> Question number two. Uh, I've heard many times that you format your SD card between or before your next wedding job, or variants of these. If I shoot just as an enthusiast for family and personal projects, so I guess the question is, how frequent is it advisable to format the SD cards? Um, that's part A. Part B, if I format the SD, then the progressive internal numbering is lost. Can I prevent this? Thanks again, and congratulations. Okay, so um, I never format my. I don't. I don't reuse my memory cards until that wedding is delivered. Yeah. So, so in I any other industry, uh, portrait, you'd work the same way. Presumably, yeah. yeah. I just stick the. I. I. I got little glass jars. I stick my you memory cards in. You shed load of memory. I got a lot of memory yeah. cards. Yeah. Might have to buy some new ones before we head off on our <laughs> road trip next week. Oh yeah. Um, we haven't talked about that. No. And uh, I wonder what the national speed limit is in Switzerland. <laughs> We'll find out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I wouldn't... I mean, if you're a hobbyist, absolutely, I wouldn't worry about formatting the cards as long as you're sure you've got your pictures off it. Um, uh, the other question is, uh, progressive internal numbering is lost. Can I prevent this? Um, and the answer is, I think there's a setting called reset or renew for the file numbering. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what... I only ever really kind of run into that when I get to the to the 9,999 limit. But yeah. that's been changed now in recent cameras and recent updates. It can go up to like 900,000 or something. So it never really worries me. And I, if I'm absolutely honest with you, I never worry about the, the, number, the file num- names in the camera. I reset my file names in all my cameras. Yeah. So my X-Pro3, for example, the, the file name is XP3-1. Mm-hmm. So that means my first XP, X-Pro3 yeah. underscore... Um, and, then the number. and then the number just yeah. automatically gets added. And so, then actually, don't you just put them in, in time order? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's not something. So I, the uh, basically, I don't know the exact answer to that. Um, yeah. It's not something that would worry me. What do you do? Do you rename well, your files? Um, I uh, import it all through um, using Photo Mechanic, um, and then I reorder them according to time. Uh, I might shuffle a few round in in bridge, and then I rename everything. It's usually something like Smith Edit from number one onwards. So I don't really take any notice of the mm. uh, of the the file name, names and numbers at all. I will say one thing: we were talking um, recently about uh, people that actually edit on the fly. Mm. In other words, they um, not so much formatting, but deleting stuff while it's on your card. This mm. is an absolute do never ever don't ever do. The worst thing you can possibly ever do is start to muck about by deleting stuff off your disc. You, in fact, just don't do it. No, no. please, no. no, no, no. Do you know why? Yeah, because you might delete one you want to use. No, because it can completely screw up the internal um, registry of of numbers on your disc as mm. you're going along, mm. and you can corrupt everything. Yeah. Well, don't do that then. Okay. Terrible idea. That was a good public warning, wasn't it? That yes. Was, right. Public announcement. A public announcement. Um, is it my turn? It's your turn. All right. Uh, Brian Yorks, two-part question. While I don't shoot with Fuji, I, I really love listening to the podcast. We always say that you don't have to shoot 
Fuji to listen to the podcast. Absolutely not. Currently, my main camera is um, a Sony A7R4, and I've been using Sony for the last couple of years. However, I'm starting to think about moving on to Fuji. Currently, I'm borrowing an X-T3 with a few lenses, and I find most shots with even lighting look fine, comparable even when pixel peeping. The Sony is sharper, but not by much. I'd say even when comparing shots exposed properly, even up to ISO 12800, they look extremely close to the Sony. The issue that I'm running into is low light. Without the flash or adding light, can I really expect, or can I somehow get my photos to brighten up? I found even upping the exposure dial doesn't really help. Hmm. The Sony just wins out without doing anything such as uh, upping the exposure. It has a second part. Let's let's deal with that part first. Hmm. And you've, you've not used the Sony, so it's very difficult for you to, to have hmm, a... No, I haven't used Sony, but, um, you know, exposure is exposure is exposure, and so the difference comes down to the sensors, presumably. Uh, and presu- uh, Again, I'm not 100% sure. You mean about the detail in the, uh, the, the, the exposure, I suppose, I th- what it means. Yeah, I mean, let, let's just say you're taking a picture of exactly the same thing in exactly the same lighting conditions using exactly the same three parameters of the exposure triangle on mm-hmm. two separate cameras then the the results the difference in the results can only be down to the sensor yeah um now that could be that be because the um the sony camera might be full frame i don't know if it is or yes, not it is. so yeah, yeah, which yeah. B- just by science alone means it will be marginally better at low light um noise kind of handling i suppose mm-hmm. um and detail yeah and detail as well because of the larger pixel mm-hmm. sense i suppose pixel size but or pixel density but honestly i think that would be marginal um I, i've always said this about the fujifilm cameras is that y- y- at low light y- you know you're you are using aps-c so you, you you're kind of mitigating a little bit of noise mm. because you're using aps-c but because the cameras are smaller so your sony full frame camera um, whilst the camera itself is, is is small enough, I think, but the lenses are quite big and heavy. So you can typically shoot at lower um, exposures, lower shutter speeds, because you're using a lighter camera and, you know, m- mitigate that, that kind of noise difference, I guess. Um, but who knows? I mean, at the end of the day, if you're getting better results with your Sony, then stay with your Sony. That's That makes 100% sense. Um, you know, uh, that's that's basically it, isn't it? You've disappeared. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I've <laughs> wandered off. Left me will, waffling all by no, myself. I've got no one to waffle to. I think you're doing so well. I thought I'd wander <laughs> off into the corner and get the next thing. I agree with you, though. If, <laughs> what um, did I say? I, you weren't even listening. No, if, if, <laughs> I suppose if it comes down to making a decision on wanting to use the Fujifilm because you like the form factor, there's something about... Because obviously the dials and the way it works, I, I think people talk about going to Fuji for that reason alone sometimes, don't they? Having the exposure triangle at your fingertips mm. uh, with, with, the, uh, with the dials. But um, I suppose the Sony kit can be heavier. Um, the lenses are heavier, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, basically, whatever whatever you, you, you get, gets you the best results, then, then yeah. go for it. But don't forget, it's not always about the perfect in the image no. you know i mean we've just been talking about perfect moment, um, Trump's perfect richard image. uh richard prince, richard prince yeah. and sam abel's pictures neither of them are technically no. you know they're, they're, they're not sharp or anything but that's yeah it depends what you want uh second part also who do you guys use for for your business websites i'm thinking of trying to get into portrait family weddings and i'm not sure yet if i would but looking at various sites on creating a professional business website i'm trying to find something that's inexpensive that allows me to set up private portfolios for customers who can also purchase images, prints, and so on and so forth. I suppose actually it might be worth um, d- developing a site out of something like Zenfolio or PickTime if if you want to save yourself a bit of cash, but you want to put everything on the same platform. Depends depends how much you want to, this this to be your you know your, your main earning. Yeah, I think I think the question the, the point in that question was as a portfolio yeah. for clients to you know to go and proof and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Then yeah. something like Zenfolio and PickTime. Are, are perfect for that. Perfect, yeah. um, better than something like Squarespace, which means you would you, you don't have the kind of proofing elements where they no. think about plugins and stuff. So, right? Have you uh, you got a? Uh, we've we've got one of our photo disasters that we've left right to the end. I meant to do this much earlier on. Um, should we l- launch on the photo disaster? Yeah. Or do, do, do a question. Should we do one of those no. and end the show on a photo disaster? Let's do the photo disasters at the end. Do I think you, that's great. Yeah. Have we got a jingle? Uh, have we got a jingle? If I haven't got a jingle, do you not want to do it? What, me do the jingle? <laughs> you can do the jingle. Photo disaster. <laughs> hey. I've got a jingle. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so that was it. 
Uh, that's the feature done. <laughs> that was the disaster. <laughs> that's the disaster. <laughs> Nobody wrote in. No, no, we've got a few. Um, please make sure you send these in because um, I think we can have a lot of fun with these ones. So we're going to kick off with John Baisley. Hello. Firstly, thank you for the time and effort you both put into the podcast, writing reviews on cameras. Well, that's for you, Kev, because the amount of time you spend writing reviews on cameras. Talking about free work, I mean, I know some of it you get paid for, but a lot of the time you, you do that sort of stuff. Absolutely zippo. I get you? nothing for Absolutely those reviews zilch. or anything. Nothing. I only get paid if I do a, a presentation on the and stage. And what about your YouTube uploads? I mean, obviously you're a millionaire from that by now. Millions. Aren't you? Huh? Millions, yeah. You've got your Tesla outside. Yeah, I've got two of them. <laughs> Yep. It's really appreciated, yada, 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 says, says John. Mm. My photography mishap might not be all that great in the grand, grand scheme of things, but I am going to share it with you. Whilst working in Sydney for the Olympic Games in 2000, I bought myself a lovely film Ricoh GR camera. I've always wanted one of those. Yeah, they look nice, don't they? $600 worth at the time, mm. compact camera at the time, to document the events and people of the day. At the end of the Olympic Games, Sydney put on a lovely fireworks display over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um... And I thought I'd go down and have a beer, sit down on the rocks of Sydney Harbour and photograph the lovely display. Now, I know Sydney's got its own problems at the moment, but I can't blame you for doing that. I, was, I, I did something very similar myself when I, when I visited. Mm. It was an amazing city a couple of years ago. Anyway, I placed my camera down on a rather large rock and proceeded to walk forward a little whilst holding my beer. You know what's coming. Which caused the boulder to move ever so slightly, but enough to create a several degree incline which allowed my beautifully crafted full alloy bodied Rico Uh to slide ever so gracefully at a kind of 120 frames a second speed, plopping into the clear waters of the South Pacific Ocean between two large boulders weighing more than a VW Beetle in four feet of water. (laughs) Four feet of water doesn't sound that much, but it can be, I suppose, can't it, when it's wedged between... It's a lot. To this day, the lovely sharp lens of the Rico is still pointing to the skies of Sydney, looking hopefully upwards as it did to me when I shone my torch to retrieve it many years ago to no avail. So, looking back, it says more about me as I chose to hold my beer, really, rather than leap down and save my camera, I guess. <laughs> well, what would you have done? Um, well, <laughs> yes, the beer probably wins out. <laughs> the beer wins but out. It's interesting. So, that camera is still stuck there. Yeah. What are you saying? I wonder how many people have tried to wedge it out over yeah. the years. I mean, they're probably looking down and thinking, is that a Rico down there? Yeah. Or thinking that's a camera down there? Yeah. Do you think it would still work? I don't know. I wonder if the film would survive. Well, that's that was an amazing uh, thing of the polar bear that knocked a camera. It was a Canon camera, I think, into uh, into the Arctic, down through a fishing hole, and they managed to fish the camera out, and it was still working. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, all those old mechanical things. Well, this, of- this, I think, was a 5D. Oh, right. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, well, even great advert for- Better for them, then. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Next week on the Canon cast, we're going to be... <laughs> <laughs> Send your photo disasters in, please. At click of fujicast.co.uk. How did I ever doubt you'd have a jingle? See? Brilliant. Always, always have a jingle handy is what my, my dad said to me. Very true. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Wise advice. And thank you, um, too. That's what we call a segue. See, mm. going into uh, going into the, the end of the theme. They're dangerous, those things. They are very dangerous. He died, didn't he? The guy that invented them. Yeah. He went off a cliff. Yeah. It was very Darwinian. It was him. very Darwinian. Um, anyway, thank you to our, our guest this week, James Lawrence. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're, we're any closer yet to uh, sorting out, you know, this relationship between the clergy and, and photographers, but it was very interesting to, to hear what James had to say about it. If you like this week's show, please take a moment to share it. We will consider you, as we've said in the past, legendary mm. material. Um, if you haven't joined the private face group yet, please do. Um, on the note of the um, the first year anniversary birthday party, then what, what, what's our plans now? Because we, we're really pretty much at, at check the website. Yeah. Check the website. The, the contact form on the website. I will put an announcement on there. Uh, yeah. If we are allowing, if we can, sorry, not allowing. We would allow everybody, of yeah. course. But we 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 are shocked to the core of the amount of people that would like to come. We've got people coming from Saudi Arabia, I know, amazing. from Iceland, Iceland yeah, yeah, Mexico. Yeah, yeah. We've got a Mexico person Mexico, coming. Mexico, no way. Me- Cool. Wow. Um, I, there's a couple of people coming from Barry Island. 
Anybody from Merthyr? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't, don't think I'd let them anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, incredible. Absolutely incredible. And of course, Andreas will be our honorary guest yes. on the show. Andreas Giorgio. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, we, me, Neil and I are still yet to decide what to do about the alcohol. Heaven knows. Alcohol. What, 75 people traipsing into a pub. We tried to find a pub large enough last night to take 75 people to afterwards. So yeah. Not that many. Yeah, that might also <laughs> quite, be. Quite sure how we're going to do that one. And moving on quickly. Send us your questions, please. Keep sending them in. Um, it's great to hear from, from people who have never written in. It's great to hear from everybody, but it's not, nice to hear. If you've never written in, so we'll never read it out. We will send them in. Uh, and also your disaster stories to yes. click at fujicast.co.uk. They are the lifeblood of the show. Everything stops quicker than traffic waiting behind a brand new 2020 learner driver using up tuition vouchers they got for Christmas, unless you send those in. <laughs> Music is from Blue Wednesday. Uh, if you want to see our offerings to the photo community and world, there's one address, one address you now need to go to for all our personal business links. And Lady B will tell you what that is. Karen and Neil have their own websites, but I thought it would be easier to give you one website address with all the links you could possibly ever need. www.futurecast.co.uk forward slash the boys. boys we're off on a, a, on a Swiss adventure. We're we on, are. Me and Kev are off on a Swiss roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Five days in the Alps. I know. Or is it four days. Or is it uh, five days? Four, four days. Four days. Uh, Wednesday, any... Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Five days. No, Thursday. We fly Thursday. No, we fly Wednesday. Do we fly Wednesday? Yeah, we I didn't know we fly. Sure. Oh, right. Okay. Sure right. Yeah, the Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way. 